Chris Galizer here with Matt Howell. And on this episode of The First Run, Matt and I are going to talk about Swiss Army Man, starring Daniel Radcliffe and Paul Dano and Mary Elizabeth Winstead, which I was pleasantly surprised by. Uh, it's um, a little independent film about a guy that gets what lost on an island, Matt, and then he finds a multi-utility corpse. Uh, we'll talk about that. Well, I'm going to talk. Uh, we're also begun our second marathon, or our most, our newest marathon, I should say, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, where we watch Star Trek: The Motion Picture, and then it's going to be the return of Who Dat, everybody's favorite role-playing game with 10% less leather. So, Matt, let's go ahead and hear a clip from Swiss Army Man. Back in civilization, there's seven billion other living people on the planet just running around and blinking and breathing and eating, and you used to be one of them. You were probably just looking for happiness. That's what everyone does. This is what you look like when you're happy. You look for someone who will make you happy, a friend, a girlfriend, or a dog. Good boy. Good boy. Sometimes... You might be lucky enough to bump into the one person you want to spend the rest of your life with, and that is love. Matt, so I gave a general rundown, but why don't you explain to the kids at home, what is Swiss Army Man? That is a good question. Um, Essentially, it opens up um, Paul Dano. He's on a very tiny little island. He's getting ready to kill himself. Um, when he notices the corpse um, has washed up ashore of the corpse of Harry Potter, and um, he basically um, fishes him out, is going to kill himself again when he discovers that... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not giving too much away that his, his this guy's flatulence, he allows him to ride him across the ocean to a much bigger secluded island um, where he spends trying to, the rest of the movie trying to find uh, uh, the civilization. And and Daniel's around a cliff, and of course he suddenly starts talking and, and coming to life and has all kinds of awesome uses, hence the title. He's a Swiss Army man. Yes. So, Matt, this is another release from uh, TFR Favorite A24. Studio. A24, yeah. exactly. So do you, uh, what do you think? Do they have another hit in their hands? Are they? Oh, I should say, I don't know if I should use the term hit, because I don't yeah, know if A24 is that. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. But the I would say... They've had to a hit. So, yeah, so would you say, though, they have another winner? In their hand, in their in their portfolio here, definitely, definitely. I I, uh, I enjoyed this a lot more than uh, what was our last day twenty four film, The Lobster. Um, yes, yes. Um, you know, it had kind of again a quirky sensibility, um, but you know what? Um, for a movie with essentially two actors and uh, and uh, uh, we'll call a quarter of a Mary, a Mary Elizabeth Winstead, um, they they really sell the hell out of this thing. It's 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 a fun a fun time with a lot going for it. Yeah, I was I was intrigued because I, I I was a little nervous going into it because I thought it was going to be too gimmicky, you know. Uh, as you know, Derek, I almost said Harry Potter. As Daniel Radcliffe, you know, exhibits all these different abilities that allow Paul Dano to live. And as you as the film's progressing, part of it, you start wondering, like, well, is this all like in this guy's head? Mm-hmm. Is this all BS type stuff? Is like, is is he really just basically a hundred feet from Mary Elizabeth and Winstead's backyard mm-hmm. the whole time? But he find right. a corpse that he's just playing with. So clearly, he has some deep, deeply rooted psychological issues. If you th- if you look at it from that perspective, he's a guy <laughs> playing with a corpse in the backyard of the woman he's stalking. Mm-hmm. Right yeah. now, the ending of the film, I guess, kind of makes it where that's really not what's happening. Mm-hmm. That maybe there's is a little bit of magic in this universe wherever this film takes place. Uh, and I th- and and I think I appreciated that because as the film evolves, uh, you know, as as the film rolls out and as we get to the final act and to the ending of the movie, it does kind of set that up, right? That we got th- she's lucky she hasn't been killed and he has her head on top on t- in, yeah, inside he's not, he's not wearing her uh, her skin as a cape or something like that. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> but it, the way it ends, it kind of it puts in like you know what maybe uh, now I think there's. There's a little that uh, uh, the Daniels. It's directed by two guys named Dan, Dan Scheider mm-hmm. and Dan Kwan. They they build themselves as the Daniels. Now they um, uh, they do play with that, right? I mean, there's stuff throughout the film where you're like, "All right, is this reality? Is mm-hmm. is this or is, uh, should I quote the classic? Is this real life or is this just fantasy?" Um, so <laughs> it's and I go like like there's parts of it, and I think you're allowed to pick and choose. Like part of me thinks he was never on an island. That never happened. Right. 
Right. Clearly, I think that's the case. Right? Yes, I, I, I agree with that as well. I agree that he was never on the island. So, um, and then there's this whole thing that happens in the forest as they're trying to look, make their way back to civilization. Uh, I think you're allowed to kind of pick and choose your own adventure. But I, I don't know. I agree with you. I really enjoyed it. It, it had a very uh, Michel Gondry-esque feel to me mm -hmm. uh, as a film played out. If you're familiar with any of his work, I think you'll, you'll be able to spot that. Um, but another thing, too, I want to say, this is for me really the first time that I think Radcliffe was able to shed the Harry Potter persona. Okay. I really, I think I really, at no point was I thinking Harry Potter with him in this film. When most of the things he's been in, I've still kind of had that vibe with him. So I think this is a big ba breakthrough for uh, Radcliffe. So I'm very excited for him that he can mm -hmm. kind of push through that uh, typecasting. So yeah, and then, so yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm mean, that's really all I have to say. Man, I really enjoyed it. I think it's 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 a fun little film. It's a it's it's a little dark at times um, with mm -hmm. its humor. It also has some interesting interplay between the relationship between Dano and Radcliffe that are that's interesting. That uh, uh, I don't want to reveal too much about, but I just add some more depth to the characters yeah. and really into Dano's psyche and what's going on with him. As the more stuff that he seems to portray or uh, uh, project, I should say, onto onto Manny as onto Daniel Radcliffe, uh, the more you get a, a view into uh, Paul Dano's character and what's really going on with him. So yeah, I don't know. I I enjoyed it though. If I if I had to give this sucker uh, a a rating, I would probably go B plus A minus for me. I right. really I really enjoyed this. Yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's a B plus. I mean, this is a tough film I think to talk about, um, especially in the format that we have. I mean, it's really just such a, a a small film that's all based on um, you know these two performances for the most part, and and obviously you don't want to spoil a lot of the stuff that uh, <clears throat> the jokes and the kind of the things that happen. And I'm with you. I mean, it, it could be viewed as, you know, a metaphor, um, kind of like a metaphor for the lonely guy, you know, in his 20s and kind of things like that. And you can kind of pick and choose what you think is real and what's not. I mean, uh, up really up until the end, I was I was thinking this is all in his head. This is obviously just mm -hmm. a metaphor for something. Uh, I wasn't really thinking that, you know, that Daniel Radcliffe was shooting bullets out of his mouth or something like that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, I, but I think it's a well done film. I think it's a well done character study. It's probably something that's going to be, you know, a cult film. It'll probably have legs beyond, you know, just now. Um, so I think it's definitely something that should check it out. I would definitely give it a B plus as well. Mm, and I want to stress too. There's some moments of really, I felt almost like shocking violence in this film mm. uh, that really I was not expecting. That took me aback. More, uh, it's an interaction with an animal that I won't, you know, it's not quite um, revenant bad. But it's still uh, it's still pretty intense, I think, even for the moment. So just a heads up for the kids at home if you're gonna watch this <laughs> you're of the younger persuasion. Yeah, there is there is a couple intense scenes like that. So uh, yeah, um, do you have to see the theater, Matt? Can you wait for this to come home on video or Netflix? Um, I say yes. You could wait for this to come out home on Netflix. I don't think you're losing anything really. But again, you know, we if you want to support these type of movies and you want to kind of keep seeing these kinds of things. Um, you know, if you're of the of the mindset, go out and check it out. Probably have a good time. I agree. There's no big but. There's no big spectacle desire to see this on the big screen. I'm so glad I did. And like you said, and we said a lot recently, uh, we need to support this stuff. So go out to the theater and check out Swiss Army Man. Unfortunately, here locally, it's down to one screening a weekend, just like Neon Demon. Yeah. But I don't know. Anyway, if you've had a chance to see Swiss Army Man, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Just an email at feedback at the first run dot com. Matt. Let me tell you what's coming up on Blu-ray and DVD. And for me, it's one of the best films of 2016. And now looking back, it's also one of the saddest films of 2016. And that is Green Room, Jeremy Solnier's film about a punk group that do, uh, decide, probably ill-advisedly, to do a little rock punk concert at a neo-Nazi bar. And play, uh, and play uh, uh, the Dead Kennedys' uh, Nazi punks F off. That was probably a yeah. bad choice. <laughs> They end up witnessing a murder, and things go horribly, horribly wrong from there. Stars uh, Patrick Stewart as well as Anton Yelchin, uh, and Imogen Poots. An intense, intense film, Matt. I mean, you're on the edge of your seat the whole time, and Patrick Stewart as a bad guy is just terrifying. So, um, unfortunately, as you, I'm sure you heard, Yelchin 
um, passed away a few weeks ago, a month ago now, I think it's at this point, a horrible accident with his Jeep. I guess it was an issue that had been recalled. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's just a horrible loss. It's going to be even more difficult watching Star Trek Beyond, I think, too, because I like this kid a lot. He's yeah. been in a lot of interesting stuff. He's done a lot of great work, and that's it. But Green Room, Blu-ray, DVD, so check that out as well. Um, everybody wants some. Uh, underwhelming link later for me, Matt, about a, uh, what is it, college baseball team uh, getting ready for the big season of in the school year starting up and all the crazy adventures that I get into. Uh, <laughs> there was no breakout McConaughey moments for me, but still, uh, you can check that out. Blu-ray, DVD, Ultraviolet, and a bunch of behind-the-scenes featurettes. The Young Adult series that will not die, Divergent Allegiant, is being released on Blu-ray. Includes audio commentary by the producers and six featurettes. I haven't seen any of these films, mm. and Neither. I think I'm all right. Actually, I think uh, I think I caught like the first fifteen minutes of the first one on HBO, and it, it is it is not good. So you're not missing much, my friend. And they've made what three of these things so far? Is that all there are? I don't know. Uh, I think there's there's three books. I remember that from my time in the bookstore. All right. And then uh, new to Blu-ray, uh, Lucio Fulci's, air quotes, classic, Cat in the Brain. <laughs> includes a new high-definition digital restoration of the original uncensored director's cut. This is from Grindhouse Releasing, who gave us the awesome pieces box set uh, a few months ago. And some new uh, interviews as well. And there's two. There's three discs. One of the discs is a CD soundtrack of the film. I haven't seen Cat in the Brain, even though I'm a big Fulci fan. From what I understand, it is lesser Fulci. It's basically, it's about, he plays himself, a director slowly going mad by all the violent films he's made. And he starts seeing these things in reality. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think it's basically, a, it's a cobbled from different of his older films. Also, all the kills and stuff are kind of interspersed with him reacting to them and whatever. Uh, I haven't Sounds seen amazing. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, the first 3,000 copies, I've glow in the dark slip covers. So I actually was at a video store today and I almost bought it just because I hadn't seen it. And it's a, it's a small uh, little video store called uh, Grindhouse Tampa, Grindhouse Video Tampa. And I like to support, you know, those kind of places. And, but I ended up not pulling sure because I heard it's not that good. But I did buy uh, Dangerous Men from Draft House, mm. uh, which is supposed to be one of the great, lost, horrible, horrible movies. So bad it's good, and I've been w dying to see it. So I picked that up as a little birthday, early birthday present. Criterion is giving us Carnival of Souls on Blu-ray with a new restored 4K digital transfer, which is a it's a you take a chance, right? Because Carnival of Souls is in the public domain. So uh, if you're, I believe it is. So if you're going to okay. pour some money into it, um, but it's Criterion, so you know they're going to deliver. Includes deleted scenes and outtakes as well. Uh, and if right now Barnes & Noble, Matt, their 50% 50, uh, 50 off sale on, on uh, Criterion's or is going on right now. I think it expires August 4th or 5th. So there's okay. a couple of good things. I'll be picking up uh, Dress to Kill, I think. Dr. Strangelove uh, is on Blu-ray from them now. A nice set. And then... The New World, Malik's New World is getting released with, uh, I guess, three different versions of the film from Criterion. That's coming out in, I think, two weeks. So just in time for the sale. Just Desserts, a documentary on the making of Creepshow is being released. That sounded interesting. I think I'll wait. Hopefully, that'll show up on Netflix. But Creepshow, I think, is a lot of fun, the original yeah. film. So I'd, I'd be interested in seeing a documentary on the making of that film. It includes uh, interview, extended interview segments with George A. Romero, Tom Savini, and Bernie Wrightson, which Ooh. is like a murderer's row of horror artists if you if i may so there you go matt and then finally your straight to dvd pick of the week last week we did something really fun right we had the um hallmark baking mysteries i can't even remember exactly what it was it, it was, was like uh something about a chocolate chip cookie that's all i can remember <laughs> it's i don't know it just made me feel a little warm and fuzzy inside so, uh, but this week we're going to get back to what, uh, here we go, Matt. It was Murder, She Baked, A Chocolate Chip Cookie Mystery. There you go. So but we're going to get back to what we're all about here when it comes to the straight to DVD pick of the week. And I'm going with MILFs versus Zombies. Oh, very nice. <laughs> this is from Troma, of course, our friends at Troma. A group of moms enjoy a ladies' night out and are forced to fight for their lives when their quiet town is overrun by a ravenous horde of flesh-eating corpses. Will they be able to meet up with their husbands, save their children, who are away at summer camp, and make it home in time for dinner. Watch Mills vs. Zombies to find out. Thank you, Lloyd Kaufman. Mm. Sounds fantastic. It's, it's definitely one way of looking at it, yes. <laughs> Matt, let's go ahead then. 
let's start off the 50th anniversary tour of the Star Trek films, the original six. Let's hear a clip from Star Trek, the motion picture. Travel forward with us, 300 years into the future, to confront the greatest mystery ever to threaten mankind. We are aboard a huge starship called the Enterprise. This is the return of Captain Kirk. An alien object of unbelievable destructive power is less than three days away from this planet. Mr. Spock. I offer my services as science officer. Dr. McCoy. Scotty. And joining them on their mission, Commander Will Decker and Navigator Ilea. I'm sorry. That you left Delta IV? Or that you didn't even say goodbye? <laughs> oh, we're back. <laughs> sorry. I Even the clip from Star Trek, the motion picture, put me to sleep. Matt. <laughs> All right. So that's the big knock against TMP, as the kids like to call it, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm sure all the kids these days are really talking about Star Trek. I was hanging out at the, the local uh, uh, YMCA, and a bunch of the cool kids are hanging out and saying, hey, man, did you see TMP? I was like, yeah, man, 1979. It was, <laughs> was going to be Star Trek Phase 2. But then they decided to make the whole film out of it instead. So they had to redo all the sets and then, and then spend weeks redoing the big pilot episode. And then and then they came up with this. Yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, Star Trek The Motion Picture, uh, if you remember. And i got to tell you something. I haven't seen this in – how old am I? 28? I haven't seen this – since in probably 15 to 20 years i have not watched this movie yeah i think i saw this movie um when my my star trek fandom really started in earnest probably in high school which is a great time to really have your star trek fandom start um <laughs> and i watched it i watched it one time and I, i've literally never watched it again so this is this is number two this is the second time i've watched this film same with me i have owned it on dvd uh i have the director's cut which i did not have a chance to watch the, the director's cut and so i'm gonna do that maybe this weekend and do like a little one-off thing maybe like a youtube exclusive so you can look for that um but yeah so i i have the dvd with the director's cut i bought that years ago never watched it i had the blu-ray because the blu-ray they released all the i was gonna buy the box set of the star trek films on blu-ray when it first came out but the packaging was so ugly i couldn't stand it so i didn't buy it mm -hmm. i bought them piecemeal as they were on sale for like five bucks a pop mm -hmm. so uh, i've had this one as well i gotta tell you the transfer of this shame on you paramount it is crap it's basically just an upscale dvd is what it looked like to me i'm right. seeing specks of dirt and scratches and it's just just embarrassing embarrassing so this is my first time watching this, probably since I first saw it as a kid. And so, all right, let's let's get into it. <laughs> okay, so let's get at what it's about. So, so Kirk is an admiral now, and he gave up his command after his five-year mission. The, the whole time frame's a little fuzzy, right. <laughs> considering it's been longer than right. five years. But yeah, still, since everybody's aged like twenty years, so that's yeah. whatever. So, <laughs> still. There's an admiral now, and there is this probe thing out in the distance on its way to Earth that is destroying everything that in its wake. And he's been tasked, along with the original crew and some new people, one of them a pedophile, uh, who <laughs> is, it's just sad to say, well, I don't know if he's a pedophile, but he, 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 what, he engaged in the collection of child pornography. We'll put it that way, because that's what happened. I, I, you have to. You have to elaborate. I, I'm, not, I'm not recalling what. Stephen Collins, about. William Decker, the guy from the yeah. uh, the, the Family Show on the, whatever the, that family. He got popped for a kitty porn. Oh, oh, you're, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm like, dude. I'm like Captain Decker. Did he get? I'm like, no. Okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Thank yeah, you for Stephen thank Collins. You for me up. Not a good guy. Not a okay. good guy. All right, very good. <laughs> so, anyway, so they're going to intercept this thing and try and find out what's happening and see if they can stop it. Okay. So um, there's some interesting stuff in the film that I liked, you know, Kirk trying to kind of really, here's the problem. I like the stuff with Kirk trying to, he misses the fact that he's not piloting a starship. He's not captaining mm -hmm. a starship anymore, mm -hmm. right? Which is interesting when it plays with Star Trek II, which I'm sure we'll talk about next week. How his attitude about it then and his attitude about it here. But yeah. that's fine. Right. Uh, 
so it's there's a little interplay between him and Decker, you know, because Decker was the captain, and Kirk says, "Sorry, pal, you're out. You can stay on as, as my first officer, as my science officer as well, but that's it." Uh, so there's that little issue with, between them, and then there's a matter of McCoy coming back and Spock comes back, and it's a nice. I think that Robert Wise, the director, kind of handles the interaction between our characters well. The human adventure as the trailer puts it, the human element of this film, I think, works really well. The problem is Wise really goes for Kubrick in this. Mm -hmm. He's shoehorning 2001 in this as much as he can with these long, drawn-out shots. Like uh, when when they first, when Scotty and Kirk first get to the Enterprise, Matt, that's got to be, what, an eight-minute it is See? of them looking on in silence from different angles and very oh. dramatic pregnant pauses while they look at the beauty of the new enterprise. I, I get it, but we, we, we could have cut that a little bit. Just a little, a little shave it down to six minutes. Right? And it would have been fine. Movie would have been A+. Plus. Yeah. But the problem is the, the movies, the film's filled with those types of things where it's going for beauty and awe when it's really just monotony. Right. And now let's let's and then I think one of the criticisms of this film and possibly fairly so is that the, the triumphs of this film are the special effects. Yeah. That really you should really attribute the film to the to the two special main special effects guys and really not Robert Wise. Those are the people that make this film interesting. And let's be clear, given the time, there are some amazing effects in this film. Not practical effects, computer effects, what you want to call it, some gorgeous matte paintings. For me, it's just kind of just like the end of that era of just the big effects that were all done, you know, in in house in studio, right. on set. And that's and that's funny that you say that. I mean, um, you know, I was thinking the same thing as far as the the effects. I mean, like a lot of the the model work that they do and the space shots. I mean, it's it's it looks really it looks really incredible, you know, with the impractical effects. But it's funny that you mentioned the matte paintings because that was actually going to be one of my biggest criticisms. The matte paint, whoever they got to do. The matte painting on mm -hmm. San Francisco and the map and the matte painting on, on Vulcan, they should have gotten their money back because those were absolutely terrible. They look took me out a little bit there. I like that. I like the way they looked because it, it just felt old Hollywood to me. Okay. Um, having those in here uh, in in the film, I, I appreciated it. You're right. They're not. They're they're far superior matte paintings in films that are 40 years older than this movie. I get that, right. <laughs> but I still think that. There was just it added it added a uh, a quality to it that I just I don't know that I just kind of enjoyed. Uh, I'm not sure. I, mean, I think one of the big criticisms of the film too is that it does feel like a long drawn out episode of the show. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. one of the more boring episodes of the show. I think the mystery of the film itself and the final reveal could have been insanely interesting and fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think it could have been just a revelation, just something on the screen like, holy, God, that is so incredible that this thing happened and it ran into these robot machine planet and then this thing happened. And then I think story-wise, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But for I think just uh, I think that's the problem is that you're stretching it out to a two-hour film. An hour-long episode of Star Trek, this could have been one of the greatest episodes probably ever. But mm -hmm. when you have this much padding and this much – just drawing out of this stuff, I think that's where it suffers. Because mm -hmm. in concept, I love the idea. You? Well, well, no. um, you know, I, I think I think you're right. You hit the nail on the head as far as this, this is uh, basically an extended episode of the show. Um, I think the problem for me, uh, one of the many problems for me for this for this uh, film is the fact that one. They pay. They focus on the wrong things during the actual bulk of the movie. You know, instead of getting to the whole point of V'ger and this unstoppable force and like just what you're talking about, we spend half the movie, you know, shaking out the uh, the problems in the Enterprise and like inexplicably going into some kind of wormhole thing, like just stuff that just doesn't matter. It's completely extraneous. You don't need it at all. Um, I understand they're trying to do it to give some stakes and drama but it's completely separated from the rest of the film it doesn't make any sense to have it there at all it's just if they had cut a lot of that out and as you said just stuck with the entire v'ger voyager uh uh um plot line this probably could have been a, a halfway decent film and yeah. the other big and the other big thing that i that i honestly that i had with this and you'll see this change 
especially with the next one we're going to watch them, but even through the rest of the original films, is that everybody in this seems like this is how Gene Roddenberry would have wanted them to act. They're all very wooden. Like, Kirk has very little fun, and he has none of his kind of, like, joie de vie of, of like, being Kirk. I mean, like, he doesn't yeah. have any of that. I mean, and it just takes away from it. He's just this, he's like an even more humorless Captain Picard as an admiral or, like, robot. He's like, it's it's just the cast, it just doesn't work. I mean, the only one who has any personality really is Scotty and Bones. Everybody else is kind of like these blank slate ciphers who are looking at, uh, looking very serious and stern in the distance, you know? So I don't know. I think they had a, they lost a big opportunity with that, but luckily they course correct for the rest of these series. I think. Yeah. I think you're, I think it's a great point, Matt. You're entirely right. They are almost paper characters. Not, I mean, they're just line delivery devices, right? There's really no, I think that's a great description. Thankfully the film was financially successful enough to warrant a sequel. Uh, though with a slashed budget, and we'll talk a little bit about that next week when we get into Star Trek Two: The Wrath of the Khan. Uh, how they, well, how they took care, how they did what they did budget wise with the right. second film. It's a really interesting story. Right. Uh, but yeah, I'd have to agree with you. I think it's, it's. Whew. I mean, I haven't seen Star Trek Five since it came out in the theaters, and that's considered to be the worst in the series. From what I but, remember, Star Trek Five it has the opposite problems. It's a little too goofy. In the yeah. wrong places, from what I remember. So we'll see. There's an article though that I think I may have mentioned this, and I'm gonna I want to read in time for that for that episode. Uh, by I think it's called Den of Geek. They they, mm. they make an argument of how Star Trek Five is actually one of the best in the series, and how it's a, a critique of religious extremism. Mm. Uh, I don't know if we can give Shatner that much credit, but <laughs> I still I want it's, it's interesting enough idea. Yeah. I don't want to see what the hypothesis is and how he comes up with it. So that'll be interesting. So anyway. Oh, another thing too, I almost forgot. Matt, if Star Trek, the motion picture, is responsible for anything, get anything mm. good from this. I know, say it. It's the score. Yes. It's, 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 a, the, it's the next generation score. Is what it, it is one of the classic science fiction scores. It is, mm. if not one of the best scores in the history of cinema. I am not, be, I am not being hyperbol hyperbolic about that. <laughs> it is a classic film score. What... What he's able to do with this thing, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, the oh, the fact that it even has almost an overture at the beginning of the film, right, with Il Ilya's theme, uh, is just it's fantastic. So it is one of the classics, like you said, the next generation re reused. They, I think they tweaked it a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit. but yeah. for the for their opening title as well for the next generation show. But it is one of the greatest uh, film scores you'll ever hear. So mm -hmm. it's got that going for it. It does have that going for it. But to temper that, I mean, worst Starfleet uniforms ever. And I'm glad they dished them after this one. This one. Uh, oh, God. Uh, go they, I mean, the they thing, are so bad. It screams 70s. It, mm -hmm. you know, it really screams the 70s idea of what the future would be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if you look at any science fiction from, from the 70s, everybody seems to think that we're all going to be in basically matching unitar jumpsuit type things. It seems to right. be. Short sleeves. Like, Deep V's to show off the hairy chest, you know, inexplicable belt buckles everywhere, but no belt, just the buckles. <laughs> I love when McCoy beams aboard the Enterprise. He's got that big old BG Saturday Night Fever medallion yeah. in the uh, group he has <laughs> his beard. And it's, it's like he just walked off the discotheque to his beam on over to the ship. But uh, yeah, no, you're, yeah, you're entirely right. I think I love the uniforms um, from, I loved it from two on. The coats mm. with the what do you call those even things? The flaps. I don't know. You. I don't know what. The, I'm sure they have. Who the hell? I just know that Kirk had to loosen that shit up every now and again. That's right. To, boom! <laughs> gotta let that go. That's right. <laughs> he's got his. He's got his red crushed velour suit. His uniform. And he's got to. He's got to pop that sucker. That's right. <laughs> So, yeah. All right. So that's uh, clearly we're underwhelmed by revisiting Star Trek The Motion. I got to admit, I was kind of hoping that for me it was going to be a, not I don't want to say lost classic, but something I had overlooked or didn't appreciate at the time. But I don't I don't think that's the case. We'll see if when I watch a director's cut, if that makes a difference. But mm, I don't know. I think you're going to be disappointed. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So there you go. If you had a chance, if you're going to follow along, if you've watched TMP, uh, let us know. It's just an email at feedback at the first run.com. Matt, let's take one more break, come back, and then it's time to. Would you like to play a game?
Is that how he says it? How does he say it in no, Saw? Close enough, close enough. I haven't really seen the Saw films. Yeah. Who that? When we get back. Tonight we are going out into Wellington Central. It is important that we look good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I like One it. of the unfortunate things about not having a reflection is that you don't know exactly what you look like. Ooh, look, a ghost cap floating all by itself. We can give each other feedback and help each other out until we're looking great. Yeah, some of our clothes are yeah. from victims. You might bite someone and then you think, ooh, those are some nice pants. Do with no. these. Change it. When you're a vampire, you become very sexy. We are trying to attract victims to us. Not sure about the waistcoat. I go for a look which I call dead but delicious. We are the bait, but we are also the trap. Hello, ladies. Who that? It's a role-playing game where we have to answer the question as the person. So, Matt, you are Scarlett Johansson. You know what? And if you ask the question, I have a Scarlett Johansson question, too. And if you ask this, um, I quit this game. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what mine is going to be is you are now the highest grossing actress in Hollywood history. Oh, okay. What are your thoughts on that? How did that happen? <sighs> How did that happen? How did that happen? Well... You know, my, I first started, um, you know, in little films like Ghost World. Um, you know, then I uh, succumbed to Hollywood pressure and I, you know, had a little bit of work done. Not too much that you can really tell, but I mean, you go back and look at me in Ghost World, you can tell that I've had a, little, a few things done. Um, just kind of, you know, good actress. I was in a few indies and then suddenly um, Joss Whedon wanted to look at my feet while we were in The Avengers and bam, here we are. And I made tons of money. I, uh, I uh, talked my way into all kinds of cuts at the back end. So here we are. Now I can do whatever I want. I can do stupid Luke Besson movies that make no sense. And everybody loves me anyway. <laughs> yeah, that Lucy film is just... Uh, I don't know. I'm one of the people who love that movie. And I just don't know what to say to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's because they probably really believe that we only use 10% of our brain. Oh, I hate that. I hate when people say that. Mm -hmm. It is so not true. Anyway, all right. Yeah, I mean... I, my, my thing is, my it's not because of Scarlett Johansson that she is the highest grossing actress in cinema it's because history. Of the I, roles that, it's the role she picked. Exactly. I mean, yeah, they're, they're not on the power of her performance. And I'm not saying that to put her down. She's a, mm -hmm. she's a great actress. Mm -hmm. I like Scarlett Johansson. I think she's great. Mm -hmm. But it's when you get into the Marvel franchise and you do – and you pop in basically in almost every one of the films mm – -hmm. That's it. There's your there's your money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but she's done some great stuff. She's brilliant in Lost in Translation. I absolutely loved her in Under the Skin. You want to talk about a weird sci -fi, science fiction movie, yeah, there uh, but it is exceptionally a good film. So, um, and and not for the reasons that you think, pervs. We actually like the film in and of itself. That's right. That's right. <laughs> she's really funny I mean, in Don John, a movie that's okay. I mean, you know, she's great. So, yeah. But that's the thing. I mean, those... You know, loss on translation under the skin, those smaller films, those are not the things that are giving her money. I mean, it's really Black Widow. It's, you know, her cut of the Avengers, her cut of Avengers 2, being in, basically being the co-lead in the Captain America movies at this point, um, ever since Winter Soldier. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's where she's getting all this money from. And you know what? More power to her, I guess. But exactly. it's not, yeah. And in and, and, and her defense too, what the hell is going why haven't we why haven't we gotten in a Black Widow film yet? We got an Ant Man movie mm -hmm. and we don't have a Black Widow movie yet. I you can't justify that to me. I don't understand. You can't tell me that there's not gonna there's not well, you know, the, there's not gonna be a real pull for a female super BS, all right? Well you could have done it, you could have done it in wave two. Mm -hmm. After yeah. after Winter Soldier, you could have done a Black Widow film. I firmly believe that. Yeah, I think there's definitely an audience for it. I guess my argument would be that even though Marvel is releasing, you know, 100 movies a year, they can only release so many. And I think they're trying to get more properties out there to make even more money to expand on. I mean, obviously, like I said, she's basically, she's like the co-lead in Captain America. I can't imagine a Captain America movie without or playing a big role in it, or Black Widow being in a big role in it. So I guess if they're more, let's get Captain Marvel out there, let's get, you know, 
uh, Doctor Strange out there. Let's get the Guardians of the Galaxy out there. There's only so many that they can fit out there. Yeah, that's fine, I guess, still. And listen, if they end up going Brie Larson as Captain Marvel, I'm going to be ecstatic. We've been pushing Brie Larson on this mm -hmm. show for years. Yeah. We've been big fans of her, so I'm, I'm excited. I hope that actually ends up happening. That would be great. So anyway, all right, what do you got, Matt? All right. So, Chris. Yeah? Who you're am chaining, I? You're, you're chaining Tatum. Okay. Naturally. Of course you are. It's, you're just so handsome. It's so Channing Tatum. Gambit has had a lot of issues. This is your pet project. This is something you are trying to be. This is like Ryan Reynolds. And I feel like you're very you're getting as your critics that you pay a lot of attention to, your favorite critics on the internet, you're getting very close to going on the wrong side of the Channing Tatum line here, the Tatum line. So is it time to just give up on Gambit and move on, or is this something you keep fighting for? No, I think that I think it's gonna. I think we're gonna still move forward with this. Um, I now here's a problem. I am not very self-aware, and I don't appreciate the <laughs> fact that nobody really gives a crap about Gambit. Gambit is a big hero in the night in the whole the '90s version of the X-Men. Mm. I don't know if there's really a pull for him, but you know what? It'll still get made because because 20th Century Fox finally saw some sweet sweet mutant cash uh, with Deadpool. So um, I think they're going to be more on board with making more X-Men films now. I think they, they probably think they've found the formula. So um, it's a matter of matching up the right star with the right character and injecting some dick jokes. Uh, and I think that's <laughs> I think that they think that's going that's probably their formula now. So it'll get done. It'll happen. I don't know if it'll be any good. And it doesn't seem to really impact my career, thankfully, because I also did that god awful uh, Wachowski family. I almost said brothers. Wachowski. I don't know what they go. Just the Wachowskis film. The Wachowskis now, yeah. Um, with 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 uh, Mila Kunis, Mila Kunis. So um, that nobody went to see that Jupiter Ascending. So, mm -hmm. but I was, you know, what? I was fantastic in uh, Hail Caesar, the Coen Brothers film. So you should go watch that just to see me. But I'm excited so, about it. It'll be good. It'll be different. It won't be kind of like the. I think people are getting kind of tired of the X Men. Like if you look at the returns for um, uh, uh, the most recent one, the uh, Apocalypse. Yeah. But give it some time. You'll see me in with the headband and the purple, throwing, uh, playing cards at people. <laughs> so and and just one follow up question, Mr. Tatum. Can can you give us a little little bit of your uh, your Cajun accent for us, just to see how how it's gonna go. <laughs> This will probably actually won't be that far off. Um, I'm just gonna go. Oh. <laughs> so you're just gonna be you're just gonna be Paul for home throughout the whole thing. <laughs> I guarantee. <laughs> Give me some of that gumbo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. I can't wait. I can't wait. Lots of crawdads and pole boys. It's gonna be. Uh... It's like I'm sitting in the French Quarter right now, Mr. Hitz. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Matt, speaking of uh, uh, actors having a poor run lately, you're Zac Efron. Mm. You've been a run of poor films lately. A lot of your last few films have not done well at all, including the uh, the most recent one that they're concerned is not going to do pretty well. The one with, uh, what is it, uh, Mike and Dave need, need, need wedding dates? Anna Kendrick and Aubrey Plaza. Yeah. Uh, um, the line? Yeah. So I mean, let me ask you. Are you getting nervous that maybe the fact that you, just taking off your shirt is not going to be enough to keep bringing people in the theaters? Um, well, frankly, yes. Um, but at this point, uh, I mean, I don't know what else I can do. I mean, obviously, I've tried to stretch my acting muscles, and if those don't work, I can't go and do some deadlifts to make get better at acting. So I'm just going to sit here and work this out. I'm, I'm going to play. I think I understand my niche now. I'm just going to play kind of like a dim kind of good hearted guy, like in the neighbors series. I'm just going to try and get as much goodwill as I can off that. And I'm, I'm going to ride this train as long as I possibly can, because I know we're really close to the end of the line. I don't know, Zach. I think you're cutting yourself a little short. I think you just haven't maybe found the right projects. So I, I'm still, I still believe you. I think there's some talent in there. There's more to just a, than just a pretty face. But if I would suggest one thing is just referring to yourself now as simply the Zach, I think, um, or at least your body as the Zach. I think that's might be the best way for you to go right now. Very good, very good. I'm gonna take a book. I'll take a page of the Dwayne the Rock Johnson's book. There you go. 
What do you got for me? All right, so you're Scarlett Johansson, all right? Yeah. Yeah, now you're Scarlett Johansson. All right, so you're in a coming film called nope. Ghost in the Shell, and there Start are over. a lot. I didn't hear you. All right, so where to start over from? All right. You're frozen there, bitch. Oh, there you go. All right, go ahead, try. All right, Chris, you're Scarlett Johansson. <clears throat> you're in an upcoming role. Gonna be playing um, the main character in a famous anime called Ghost in the Shell. Except Ghost in the Shell, obviously the main character was Japanese, and so was everybody else in that film. So how do you feel about the accusations that uh, you were being complicit in the whitewashing of this film? Um, well, I'm going to get makeup done to make me look Asian, so I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> Thank you, your, your sensitivity is excellent, Scarlett. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going Mickey. I'm going full Mickey Rooney in this one. Uh, are you? <laughs> no. no, I think that's fair. I think that's fair, but it's just going to be an Americanized version of the classic anime film. That's all. We're gonna take. We're gonna take it out of whatever futuristic, I'm assuming, Japanese hellscape that it's set in, and we're gonna put it in um, Vancouver, and it's gonna mm. be a whole bunch of white people, and um, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Don't worry. It'll be fine. So as long as we move it into a futuristic Canadian hellscape, we'll be fine. That's right. As long as we tell an entertaining story, <laughs> it's okay. It's an Americanized version of the film. So we'll, and we're going to follow strict percentages. So if the population of the country is 30% black, 30% of the cast will be black. If the population is 10% Asian, 10% of the, of the cast will be Asian. And that way, we're covered. Right, Hollywood? This is why you're the highest paid actress in Hollywood. That's right. <laughs> Strict percentage rules. All right, Matt. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's kind of crappy. I don't know why they couldn't find an Asian actress. There's tons of Asian actresses to do that. I don't understand. I guess I understand wanting to – you got to get a bank – this is the age-old problem in Hollywood, right? You want to get a bankable star to open your right. film. Right. But – you can't tell me that there isn't an Asian actress that couldn't do that. I'm trying to like. There's you got Kelly Hu, you have um, who well, but she's not. Well, I guess I'm, a lot of people I don't even know who she is. That's the problem, right? Right. Well, and then, I mean, and to just to undercut your argument a little bit here is literally this person that we just got done talking about as the most highest paid actress in Hollywood right now. She's obviously. That would stand to reason that that's I'm not not that I agree with it, but that she's the most recognizable and bankable for this type of thing. I mean that's part and that's part of the equation. And I can't you know, that's the problem is you, I don't know if I can really hold that against them because of that. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean you can go with Zhang Zi, you can go with Gong Li, you can go but the problem is I don't yeah, right. They're they don't have the recognition. They don't have the you're entirely right. Well, I think so. I think the problem is it's more the issue of them of not having a large enough Asian actress that could open the film. Not that it's, it's it, that's the issue in itself is that there isn't one to do it. It's not that we right. have to go to Scarlett Johansson. It's the fact that the other role is the other. There isn't an our, our actress large enough to do it. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, I don't know if I'm explaining myself what I'm trying to say. Well. I I, I struggle with, with with as the kids say words. Matt, you're. Teke Watiti, which I know I've, I've I've slaughtered, but he's the guy that did. Uh, he was involved. With what what we do in the shadows? Mm, okay. He's one of the writers. I don't. Know if, I can't remember if he directed it. I think he did. It's been announced that you're directing Thor Ragnarok. Interesting. Okay. Is that enough to get people like Chris Scalzo excited to see a Thor film? Because you're supposed to be bringing a, an edginess and a humor to the film. That you've brought to your other projects, such as what we do in the shadows, which I will say is, is a, a lot of fun. It's a great little movie if you haven't seen it. Hmm. So, is that going to be enough to turn just cold-hearted Thor haters like Chris and to, around to go see your film? Um, well, first off, let's just be let's be honest here. Um, 
everybody knows that even the Thor haters like Chris, he's going to go anyway. He's going to see the film. He's going to go see it. Um, he may not like doing it, but he's going to see it. Um, I think that the, 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 what my uh, services on this film will do will be, I think he'll be much more optimistic about what he's going to see and will have a glimmer of hope that he'll either be um, pleasantly surprised, which I, I think that he will be, or maybe he'll just be crushed and, um, you know, he will hold it against me for the rest of my career. Who knows? But let's be honest, he's going to go see the film anyway. Yeah, I think mean, you're probably right. Um, and I have to admit that I am more interested in seeing a Thor film now than I would have been previously because of his involvement. It does make me more interested. I'm not going to lie about that. Mm -hmm. So let's see if he can, because Kenneth Branagh couldn't pull it off. Uh, and whoever did the second film, or he did the second film, I don't care. Whatever. I didn't care about either of <laughs> them. So anyway, all right, what do you got for me? Said I only had two. Sorry. It was tough to come up with a couple what? of today. Sorry, man. What the fudge? Fine. Anyway, that's it. That's who dad. Who cares? If you don't care, then if you're not going to put any kind of effort in this, Matt, I'm not going to do it either. <laughs> I'm done. I'm ending the show. Next week, we're going to do – I don't even know what the hell we're going to do next week because I don't know if there's anything really that's come out that I'm excited about. Secret Life of Pats? Nah. Mike and Dave do wedding dates? Nah. I don't care about the new Tarzan film at all. I hadn't seen the last Purge film, so I don't know if I can see the next one. Um, yeah, you're really going to miss a lot. There's Finding Dory, I which I might yeah, I'd be open to Finding Dory. Um, Central Intelligence, I love me some rock. Maybe, mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe you won't do that. Maybe we'll find something online, Matt. Maybe we can pull something off of iTunes. Okay. There's usually something interesting there. So who knows? We'll figure that out. We will be doing Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Who knows if that'll be any good. Um, I we'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that. That's a big show. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Do a search for the first run. We're also on YouTube where you can watch the live stream of the show now, which doesn't really do you any good. Uh, and it'll be up for a little bit. Then I'll pull it down and post the actual assembled version of the show with all the edits, uh, which is fun. And then look on iTunes, the first run. And that's a big show for this week, Matt. Let's take an extended break, and we'll see you all in a week. And as I say, Matt, this week... Be our guest, be our guest. Put <laughs> our service to the test. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>Ensign authorization code 95, Victor Victor 2. Authorization not recognized. Ensign authorization code 95, Victor Victor 2. Access granted.